Many of you were involved in the gun buyback program on Friday. As you know, it ran from five to nine. We had five different locations across the city of Beaumont, but we actually were finished at seven o'clock. At 525, my phone started blowing up as different elders from different locations began to communicate to me, we are running out of money. And so I knew we were in trouble. And so uh, we, we began to disperse the money the best we could. Uh, we had uh, elders, staff members, parishioners taking money out of their own wallets. We had council members. We had different leaders taking money out of their wallets to give away. And uh, as I said, at 7 o'clock, we were broke. And so we had to shut the program down uh, two hours early. But through the process, we took up 28 rifles, 118 handguns, seven assault weapons for a total of 153 weapons were bought back off of the streets of Beaumont. We were able in those two hours to give out, to reimburse $28,300. We were able to spend $5,000 on advertising. And I mentioned that because many of you gave money towards the advertising for a total of $33,000 was released with this gun buyback program this last Friday. And we wanna thank you, amen. God bless you guys. One of the things that we noticed uh, through this whole program was not only did we take guns off of the street, illegal guns, guns that need, didn't need to be on the street, guns that could have been used for an illegal purpose. Not only did we get those guns off the street, but we also saw a diversity of people coming together, city, county, pastors, civic leaders. We saw a diversity of people coming together and diversity plus unity equal, equal synergy. So we were able to pull people together uh, that had not worked together before. And so for me, it was exciting, not only to see the guns coming in, but to see these different groups working together to address the issues that we're facing here in Beaumont, Texas. And so I applaud you. I applaud all the different people that were involved. And I just pray that this is just the beginning of many other times when we come together to reach out to Beaumont, Texas, and Southeast Texas, and let's make a difference where we live. Amen? Yeah. Amen. So let me say I appreciate Pastor Adolph and Antioch Missionary Baptist Church. I appreciate Charmaine James and the cathedral staff, Chief Singletary and Beaumont police officers, Sheriff Stevens and Jefferson County deputies, Mayor Ames and the city of Beaumont, City Council members Robin Mouton, Audwin Samuel, Mike Getz, and Virginia Jordan, and all the Cathedral and Antioch volunteers. God bless you guys. We applaud you, and we appreciate you so much for everything that you did. I know that this gun buyback was controversial. I get that. You know, I understand the critics. I understand that the impact a gun buyback has on reducing violent crime is marginal. I understand. I get it. But if you just, if you could have heard some of the stories that came out of this, this night, as with one mother who acknowledged that she had a mental problem and she brought in two handguns because she had kids in her house and she wanted to get rid of them. Or the 22-year-old young man that brought in an assault weapon and said, I bought this for the wrong reason and I want to get rid of it. Okay? Or the grandmother who said, I have a handgun that I keep out in the shed and she said, I need to get rid of this before somebody breaks in and, and finds it. Or the guy that brought in the machine pistol with a big clip on it that the officer said, this is the kind of machine pistol that was used at Columbine, Colorado. And this is the kind of gun that we need to get off the street. So 
in the 153 weapons received, we found the one gun we were looking for. I said through all this that if I can get one gun, one gun, I'd be happy. Now, I meant by one gun, I meant one gun that makes a difference. I understand all what we call trash guns that came in off the street. I understand that. But they, even those guns need to come off. Any gun that, when you pull the trigger, goes bang, needs to come off the, off the street. I, I get that. But we were looking for that one gun, that one gun that really makes a difference, that one gun that was in the hands of a teenager, that one gun that was in a home where there wasn't a responsible adult, or that one gun that's in a home where it wasn't secure. One gun. And we waded through those 153 guns, and we got that one gun again and again and again. We got the one gun. We got it. Yeah. In Luke chapter 15, verses 4 through 7, Jesus said, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the 99 in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors and saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I found my sheep which was lost. I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. Now, how does that apply to the gun buyback and what we're doing as a church? I just want you to understand that the difference we make is measured one life at a time. If we get one gun, if we save one victim, if we touch one person, we as Christians measure success one person at a time. I get it. We love the big events. We love the big crowds. We love all that comes with that. But Jesus makes it very clear that a true shepherd in his heart measures success one life at a time, just one. So today, we want to talk to you about the state of our city. and We want to give our leaders an opportunity to communicate to you and let you know what's on their heart and, how, and, the, and, and what they're doing to help us address our issues so, I'd like for my panel to come up to the platform. We have District Attorney Bob Wortham, Chief of Police Jim Singletary, Sheriff Zena Stevens, Deputy Chief Charlie Porter, Council Member Audwin Samuel, Council Member Robin Mouton, Council Member Virginia Jordan, and we have Gary and Lucretia uh, with uh, Stop the Violence with us here this morning. Would you please come to the platform and take a seat? God bless you guys. Yeah, come on, give them a hand. These are the leaders of our community. Go that way just a little bit with that. Let me center that. Okay. Well, guys, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. And, and as I said, guys, we threw this together at the last minute. I was on the phone calling these guys saying, hey, could you please come? We were texting them. And, uh, and they responded because they're concerned about Beaumont just like you are. And so we appreciate these guys and everything that they're doing. We, we're so appreciative of their last minute response. And so God bless you guys and all that you do. We appreciate it. Hey, Miles, come here. Go up here and get these two microphones, one back, one back, and hand it to these guys. Okay. Now, let me say this to you. I'm going to put these guys on the spot, okay? I did not prep them regarding these questions. I've been in their chair where I'm on the panel and people are asking me questions, okay? And so I understand the pressure. 
but uh, so be, be patient with them as uh, they feel this, okay? We have another council member here. Where are you at, sister? Get right, Williams. Right. There you are. Well, God, come on. No, you come up here. You, no, come up here. Let's go up here. Let's go up there. Look, they're going to get you a chair. I need you. No, come on. God bless you. All right. Beaumont is ranked the third most dangerous city in the state of Texas. The most dangerous. So, to law enforcement, Chief Singletary, Sheriff Zena, and Deputy Chief Porter, let me ask you just a few questions and give you an opportunity to communicate to the citizens that are in this room and watching uh, live on the web. Number one, citizens are afraid. But what is the real truth concerning the crime rate of the city and of the county? Uh, let me start on that. Uh, the crime rate, and, and this is what, uh, you ladies and gentlemen know that the news media and social media is doing a great job of getting a lot of facts out there and a lot of misinformation out there, <clears throat> especially the, uh, the, uh, the social media. Uh, but uh, the crime rate right now going into the, uh, the month of uh, July, I'm sorry, uh, it, it's exactly the same as it was last year. But uh, with all the, the success and all, all the, uh, uh, I guess, the performance of the new, local news media, that they're doing a good job. They're doing their job. Uh, sometimes uh, we, get, uh, 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 we don't like, to, like it that they're doing their job, but it's, violence is a big deal. Violence is a big concern. Every, everybody should be concerned. But it's not just in Beaumont. It's everywhere in the United States. We, we have, Beaumont is still a safe city. There's nobody, that, there's nobody that cares more about Beaumont than I do. I was born and raised here. My dad was born and raised here. Uh, my daughter was born and raised here, my wife. <clears throat> there are places in Beaumont that uh, are more dangerous than others, and we are aware of that. There's a lot of things I can tell you about, uh, but, but right, not right now. You'll see in the immediate future some of the things that we're working on. But the, the, uh, the, the, the truth is about uh, there is uh, a higher crime rate here in Beaumont than we'd like, but Beaumont is still a safe city. Amen. And guys, it, each one of you, as you answer a question, please introduce yourself the first time that you answer a question. Give us your name and your title so we can make sure everybody knows who is who. Uh, Sheriff Zena? Uh, I'm Zena Stevens. I'm the sheriff of Jefferson County, and I agree with Jimmy. You know, I, I think the media has sens sensationalized the numbers in terms of crime, but any crime gets our attention. And so I, too, grew up in this city. I, too, my, my whole family is from Beaumont, and so I care about what's happening here. I think the important thing for us as, as law enforcement leaders is to make sure we're doing the very best that we can to make sure our guys are in those neighborhoods, they're professional, to make sure that we are trying to find out the perpetrators of these crimes. I think um, law enforcement as a whole, we haven't kept up with the changes in the world. I think we have to get to a different type of policing. 21st policing, 21st century policing, I think is going to be important. We've got a different kind of criminal out there. We're dealing with millennials. We're dealing with individuals who don't necessarily um, take orders well. You know, um, I think we all have young adults as children, many of us here. And so how we communicate with, with individuals in our communities are gonna be, it's gonna be different than we did 20 or 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it's important for me as an administrator to t start retraining my officers on how to communicate with the people who are perpetrating these crimes. When we come, come in contact with young adults in police cars, they're not gonna respond to us the same way that they did 20 and 30 years ago. I think that's why you're seeing so many incidences on, in traffic traffic stops and on national news throughout our country. And so what I'm focusing on, you know, I'm a cop. I know there's going to be crime. I agree with Jimmy. There's going to be crime in every neighborhood in this country. 
we've got to do some things differently in terms of how we deal with the people who are committing the crimes. And so I'm focusing as an administrator how to figure that out. There's no answer to that. There's no manual written for that. And so we're, we're, we're having to think outside the box in terms of how we police. One of the most important things, I think, um, for me as an administrator, for all my officers, is being out there and connecting and reconnecting with the people in the communities that are both victims and are perpetrating these crimes, because I don't think that they trust us. Um, we can say that there's no reason for, for these individuals not to trust us, but I don't believe that. Unfortunately, as a police officer, when I turn on the TV and I see some of these incidences that are occurring, I understand why groups of people don't trust us anymore. I understand that. Um, I'm not blaming anybody. I think we've all, um, we, we stopped engaging in, in, you know, meaningful conversations many years ago in an attempt to do our jobs. We couldn't keep up with the growth, and so we just start being reactive. We've got to get back to being proactive, and that doesn't mean... Um, in my opinion, just going out and rousting neighborhoods. That means going, educating people on what we're supposed to be doing and how to survive on both sides of the badge. So what you guys are saying then, we have to teach our children personal responsibility. We all know that. We have to teach them to, to, uh, to respect and trust authority. But we also understand, and, and that doesn't negate the responsibility of leadership. I, I, I know that. But we have to teach our kids to trust, our kids to respect. Uh, but... I think you all agree then uh, that one of the problems is is you're paying for the sins of your fathers. The national media and all that we see going across the nation, the tension between law enforcement and citizens, all that gets dumped on you guys here locally, whether it's true or not here, but you're paying for the sins of your fathers across the nation where there is that case where there's a bad cop who over, you know, he oversteps, he crosses line, but the media blows that up and all that gets dumped on you guys. Let me, let me say one thing, At, you know, when we say bad cops, some of what's happening is in the effort to keep up with the crime rates, we're hiring people a lot faster and the training times are a lot shorter. Mm. And so they're not necessarily malicious people. Yeah. They're undertrained individuals who haven't developed relationships or developed skills to deal with some of the problems. And so it's easy to say they're bad cops. I, I deal with a lot of cops and I know that no cop that I, that I hire, even the very worst one, puts on a uniform that morning and goes out with the intention of killing somebody. Yeah. They're undertrained and not prepared for some of the situations that they're dealing with. That's our fault. That's our fault. And so we've got to recognize that and do a better job. <clears throat> I, I, I want to take that a little further. Uh, we, we hear bad cops. It's like Chief uh, uh, Sheriff Stevens said. Uh, we hear about bad cops all the time. I do not believe that Mormon Police Department has a bad cop. Our officers will make mistakes, but they make mistakes because they're human, not because they're bad cops. Yeah. And uh, I am very proud of our police officers. Amen. They are human, and like Chief, uh, Sheriff Stevens says, the training. I, I, at Bowman PD, we really concentrate on training. We have de-escalation training. We have racial sensitivity training. We have, uh, and these are the the, uh, the most important training kinds, kinds of training that we have uh, for the for the uh, community. We also have a counter ambush training, which obviously is safety is the, is one of my biggest concerns for my guys. And uh, it, it it does hurt when when a police officer makes a mistake uh, in in Columbus, uh, South Carolina. And then, but and the media wants to come to Beaumont or come to Jefferson County and say, "What would you do there? How come you?" And again, like you said, that, that you put it very well. This, we're playing for the sins of our fathers, and, and uh, we we are learning uh, from the from the incidents nationwide. But we'll never criticize other officers or other departments. But just like uh, uh, Sheriff Stevens said, training is very important. And that's what one, one of the things that we really are concentrating on. And, and you hit, it, you hit the uh, nail on the head earlier, when educating. You said, talked about education. One of our biggest responsibilities to our citizen is to educate them on what we're doing, what we're doing as a, uh, as a law enforcement agency, and also what, what we want them to do in, in a bad situation or in a, in like a traffic stop. We're, we have social media uh, uh, avenues that, and other ways, the uh, neighborhood association, uh, community forums, that we are out there educating our citizens. And we urge everybody to get involved uh, uh, in a neighborhood association. But I, I can tell you what, Pastor, you uh, and uh, 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 your, your, your partner in crime, uh, Pastor Adolf, Adolf. Pastor Adolf uh, have motivated a group of folks that, that I... I 
As an old, old, old police officer, I really love. And we have, we, you're motivating uh, citizens and pastors more than I've ever seen in this area. And, Thank you. Thank you. And unfortunately, I've been around longer than just about anybody in law enforcement. I'm proud of this group up here. They support us. You're, you're getting a lot of people together that have not been together before, working for a common cause to help law enforcement. And I, I, I thank you. Well, we support law enforcement. We do. Reverend, I'd like to say a few things. I'm Bob Wortham. I'm your district attorney. The way you solve a crime is in the first 48 hours. The sheriff's department, the police department, they have, they flood the area with resources. They have everybody that has responsibilities. They do their job. You solve cases in the first 48 hours. That's when you really do it. And if you don't have a large number of people at a scene, that case will very well may never be solved. But the Beaumont Police Department does a great job. The Sheriff's Department does a great job. Yeah. They pour out their resources. And it's my duty to, res to uh, prosecute the cases. Uh, I don't know if you've heard, Friday, we got 70 years on the man that uh, killed that young medical st or, uh, nursing student at Lamar got 70 years. Wow. And that's, you know, in the clone case, we got the death penalty. Um, you know, the police department, the sheriff's department, are they going to make mistakes? P possibly and probably because they're human. Yeah. But I'm telling you, their work ethic is second to none. Yeah. Uh, my, I have investigators that go out to provide uh, assistance to them. But what is wonderful about it is they try to cover every single element in the causation to make sure that they have evidence that the, who committed the crime and how they did it. Now, I'm proud of them. We've had the last four murder cases we had, we've had four convictions on murder, and then we've had the capital murder. And that's all just in a, in a short period of time. Amen. You know, let me tell you, you know some words you'll never hear out of a defense lawyer's mouth? That cop did a damn good job. Right. <laughs> you don't hear that, because their job is to find some little something that wasn't done yeah. and try to say the whole case should be dismissed because there was something they overlooked on the capital murder case on Cologne. Yeah. In opening statements, the defense lawyer said, where's the mud? The only thing he could find on the Cologne case that wasn't done by the Beaumont Police Department is they took some mud out of the front seat of the car and didn't analyze it. Some mud that came off of his shoe. It could have come at the crime of the scene. It could have come some other place, but they didn't analyze it. Yeah. And so that, they based their defense on where's the mud and tried to say, you know, the case was not made because we don't know where this mud came from. I mean, it's crazy ideas. Juries need to understand. The police department, the sheriff's department, they're going to work their butts off, and they're going to get everything they can find. Yeah. You know why they don't present some evidence? They can't find it. They don't know about it. Yeah. And we can't produce something that they don't provide to us. Yeah. So <clears throat> I think the juries are starting to understand, yeah. and I'm glad of it. Uh, so, you know, it's important that justice be done Amen. in the courthouse. And that's what we're trying to do so Amen. hard. Thank you, Bob. <laughs> Next question. Uh, Beaumont has been reported, whether it's true or not, the third most dangerous city in the state of Texas. To the law enforcement, what can you say to give us hope? <clears throat> and, and, well, the first thing right off the bat, the way that they, and, and we've, we've analyzed this, the way that they uh, 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 come up with these figures is, is at the very least skewed. And uh, I, 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 without going into a long, long dissertation about 
about about that. I, I can tell you the things, the good things that uh, the, the folks at Beaumont uh, ha have to look forward to. In first place, is the the people in this room, the people in this room right here, uh, uh, is just a part and a symbol of uh, symbolizes what Beaumont's about. We have. We have so many programs uh, reaching out to our citizens about uh, educating them, educating the kids, getting the kids with the, with the police department uh, and let them know that the police officers are good guys. This is long range stuff that's down the road, but some of, we have programs for college age kids, the uh, high school age kids, junior high and even elementary and, uh, and kindergarten. So we're reaching out uh, to, to, to the all, all ages of the kids and they're our future and also our current stuff. But I want to tell you one thing: we are solving uh, uh, more homicides than uh, than you can imagine. And just like uh, uh, Judge Wortham said, we are solving over uh, uh, seventy percent of the homicides uh, that we wow. have, and the, na the national rate is forty-eight. Uh, forty-eight percent. Our wow. guys. <clears throat> our guys. I wish you could see our uh, uh, behind the scenes how hard these officers work. And what's really sad sometimes, if we don't have physical evidence, if we don't have witnesses, uh, it, it's, it's back to good old fashioned police work. We knock on doors and, and, and look at, try to look for video and, and do cell phones. But what's really sad is that we had an unsolved murder right now in, on Harding. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the bad guys pumped about 50, over 50 rounds into the house, killing uh, this young lady's father and, and, and this little, I think it's a little 10 year old girl. Uh, didn't kill her, but she, she's going to have been in rehab for a long time. We know there were seven people in that house, and the neighbors were all out after it happened. We know that somebody, somebody knows who did that, and they are not speaking up. And that's I just that's horrible. And we, we, we know that there's the, they're afraid. That's why we have Crime Stoppers. Call Crime Stoppers. You don't have to give your name. But it, it really bothers us that... Uh, People know what's going on, and they don't call us, and that makes it very difficult uh, uh, for us. But Bowman is a, is, is a good city, and, and all the programs and the folks right here, the city council, uh, got a gentleman like Gary Senegal who's doing it, jumping out and, uh, and on his own getting groups to uh, help stop the violence. The people in this room, to, to me, symbolize what's, what's good about Bowman. One thing I'm going to say before I give it up again, uh, I think society is asking too much of the police department. It's not our job to raise the kids. It's uh, it's not our job to be the primary educator to uh, our kids. They're asking us to do too many things, but by golly, we're doing things like that. We we are ed trying to do our best to educate the kids. We'll feel bad for these. 14, 15 year old kids that we have in custody right now, they, uh, we have a 14 year old and a 15 year old kid in custody. Uh, uh, we're going to file multiple criminal charges on him. They shot at this gentleman in the West End uh, through a window, and they have no remorse at all. They didn't hit him, but they could care less. Talking to these kids, they're lost, ladies and gentlemen. And even though I've been a cop for 100 years, I feel sorry for those kids. I feel sorry for them. They have not. That's one of the biggest problems we have is a breakdown in, the, uh, in society with our family. And uh, uh, I, even though these kids are lost right now, uh, and I don't know if they'll ever, ever be found, but uh, at some point you've got to believe in the uh, Lord and I hope uh, and I mean, so many times we do turn it over to the mm -hmm. Lord. That, that, that's uh, uh, Bowman. Nobody up here has given up on Bowman. Nobody in this room has given up on Bowman, I can assure you. Amen. Thank you, Chief. And there is a lot of different approaches to, you know, to policing. And, and I think the panel is, is talk, we're, we're talking a lot about the solvability of crimes. And I want to talk about another approach. I want to talk about what we can do on the front end. You know, before our job is when, when, when the crime occurs, we're going to work cases. We're going to send people out there. The very best police departments from all of our agencies are going to go out there. I agree it is not my job to raise other people's children. But I do understand that I've got a responsibility as a citizen of this community to go out and touch some kids who don't have parents at home yeah. because our society, for whatever reason, did a poor job for, for many, many years. And so it is what it is. And so as law enforcement officers, I think in order to solve some of these crimes and also to do another responsibility that we have, mm -hmm. prevent some of these crimes, is get back in the communities and do, and, and I'm not saying at all that our officers aren't doing that at, at any of the agencies, but I think again, we have to, 
begin to understand the frustration that some of these individuals who are coming from families are committing these crimes for reasons. That the crimes are symptoms of some other reasons that our society has failed. And so we got to quit pretending that that's not our responsibility. I think that is my responsibility. Yeah. I think it's my responsibility to let people know that they can be me. They can be a Gary Senegal. They can be a Bob Wortham. And the only way they're going to do that is if they see us in a professional manner in dealing with them. One of the reasons people don't like police officers right now, and all my officers are professional, just like Jimmy said, I believe that. But because many times the other officers who are acting in a non-professional manner, we get painted with that brush. We as police officers and professionals in our career have to say, those guys are wrong. That's not who I am. We've got to establish credibility again because one officer can ruin the credibility for every one of us who get out there on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. So I'm not signing off and saying that every officer in our nation is a good officer. I don't believe that because I've seen too many things happen. And I will come out against those officers. And I think the, the good of us the ones that are professional and good have to start saying that. Yeah. Then we earn credibility in yeah. the community. Because now what's happening is when we roll through neighborhoods and we don't roll our windows down and we don't talk to them, they think we're that guy they saw on TV that break the law. Yeah. Okay? And so that's a little yeah. different approach. I believe in Jimmy's approach. I practice that approach. But I think what we got to talk about is more than one approach. we got to reach the people. You know, you guys in this church, y'all trust us. We're doing a good job for y'all. It's the people that are out there in the communities, yeah. the hoods, who don't trust us. And we have to reestablish credibility with those individuals. Let me ask, go ahead. Go ahead, Bob. Well, I'm Odwin Samuel. I'm council member of Ward 3 uh, and a practicing attorney. And one of the things I think we have to begin to do, we have to begin to communicate with one another. We can't, st we can't continue to talk at people. That's good. We have to look at individuals. Yes. Because it's already been written. We are not battling against flesh and blood. Yes. It's not about black or white. Yes. It's not about blue or brown. Yeah. It's not about colors. Yeah. We're dealing with the hearts of man. Yes. We are conceived in sin. So we have good and evil in us. Yes. Everyone. There's none perfect, not yeah. one. So we have to begin to identify those things that we see as yeah. being them. You can tell a tree by the fruit that it bears. Yeah. Everybody that's in jail is not a hardened criminal. Everybody that's been to jail does not uh, necessarily mean they will be a lifelong criminal. Yeah. We have to understand that we all make mistakes. Now, I applaud our police department, and I, 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 I've gotten kind of old, and now I call it like it is. As a defense attorney, many times I see officers, and I applaud their efforts. Is that correct, that's Chief? That's correct. It's not I about... Admit it, but that's correct. It's, it, it's, it's not about the profession. It's not about the color, it's not about the religion, it's not about the race, but it's what's within. Yeah. And that's what we battle. We battle not against flesh and blood, but principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness yeah. and high places. Those are the things that our Bible tells us that we must be watchful for. So as believers, we have to live the word and not just talk about the word. And that's what we're trying to do now. Yeah. We're trying to bring all communities together. It doesn't matter whether it's the West End or the North End. I don't get caught up on statistics. I believe there's significance. But numbers can be manipulated to what you want. I'm not saying we, are, we have a bad city. I'm saying we can improve. Our yeah. standards should be being the best that we can be. Yeah. That is our standard. I like it. Yeah. I, too, was raised in Beaumont. I, too, was educated by the Beaumont Independent School District. My mother and father were teachers. I understand. But what we're dealing with now is fear. Yeah. God does not give us a spirit of fear, but he gives us a sound mind. And we cannot allow people to have us fearing one another simply because we have some differences. 
Because as human beings, we have more things in common than we have differences. When we bleed, we bleed red blood. When we cry, we cry water tears. That's the thing we should seek to identify with. Yes. Those things that we have in common. Amen. We can't have fear because he does not give us a spirit of fear. Yes. Greater is he that's in all of us than he that's in the world. Amen. That's good. That's good. Wow. Years ago, I would define a police officer. A good police officer is someone that can investigate a case, gather the evidence, bring it to the DA, we prosecute it and get a conviction. Do you know what a great police officer is? Someone that can keep a crime from being occurred, from occurring in the first place. That is a great police officer. Let me uh, go ahead, Charlie. I'm Charlie Porter. I'm a chief deputy at the Jefferson County Sheriff's Department. And I want to address the question that you originally asked. What gives us hope? Yes. Everybody in here needs to recognize that it's not just happen chance that today we're sitting here. It's not just by chance that the BBC is here filming this. It should give us hope that we're having events like this. God works in mysterious ways. We're talking about Beaumont. The BBC is going to take this message abroad. It's, it's, it's things like this. It's us being able to sit down and talk to each other respectfully that gives us hope. I was born in Beaumont, lived here my entire life, educated at BISD, worked at Beaumont Police Department for 20 years, and here I, I sit. That, that didn't just happen. That wasn't a mistake. I'm not just sitting here by accident. We have to understand that God has a bigger plan. Amen. His plan, whether we agree with it or not, whether we think it's on our time or not, is going to occur. We have to make up our minds. We're either going to obey or disobey. What gives me hope is I know that these people here, all of you here, have a mission. These are supposed are leaders of the city. You're leaders of the city just as well. Everyone sitting in here is a born leader. Yeah. What you have to decide is where are you going to lead these people? Amen. It's good. That's what gives me hope. Let me shift now to the let, let me shift just because of time. I'd like to shift and talk to the council members and to Gary. Uh, Gary is he's uh, he has the Stop the Violence uh, movement here in Beaumont. I'd like for him to weigh in on this. But speaking to council members, what is the greatest challenge Beaumont is facing now, in your opinion? I would feel the greatest thing that we are challenging now is to forget the statistics, to go forward from where we are, and to appreciate your program, Pastor, and uh, the other churches that are involved. The challenges for, for me as a council person is to first of all be so grateful to our law enforcement agencies that we do have here and to respect what I do not know. That makes me a smart council person. Um, I respect what our law enforcement tells us. I respect the other council members that had these neighborhood associations, they interact, they know that is very important. Most of all, being an at-large council person that represents the whole city, I have the opportunity to speak to many different people about many different areas of the city and different concerns. And I have learned that you all are the experts in your community, and what you do in your community. And I have learned as a council member to listen to you. I don't go out there and tell you. You live in this community. Now, one other thing I want to say, I'm a homegrown tomato. I was born, <laughs> raised in Beaumont, Texas. 
I have been through the movements in Beaumont, Texas. The busing, the school segregations, and anything you may have. The lunch counters. And I know that Beaumont is a good city. And I know this from experience. And I know that it is the community that guides me as a council member and the respect of my law enforcement agencies into the programs that they bring forward. And that's what make me a good council person. I feel I'm a good council person. I don't know if you all agree with me. We would do. <laughs> but uh, it, the, the thing is to recognize who my boss is. And that's the public. That's the public. You guide me as a council member. And that's what I respect, is your wishes. And but what I do appreciate our law enforcement. If you see something, say something. Thank you, uh, Get Williams right. Virginia. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm Virginia Jordan, and I'm councilman for Ward 1, which is the northwest section of the city. In answer to the question, the greatest challenge that I see is how this community can back up what we are seeing now. Uh, this, the single most salient feature, I think, is the young people that don't feel that they have anything to lose. And when you have nothing to lose, you'll find yourself in some really awful situations. So how we can get these kids to believe that they are worth something, everybody is worth something. We've got a bunch of people out there that don't feel that that's the case. Yeah. Um, Education, I think, is a major, major point of that. I hate to see the enrollment uh, down at LIT. That's our saving grace for these kids to then have something to lose. There are free programs for skill training available through Lamar University. I was talking to Chief Clay the other day. Uh, we have to funnel these kids in there. We, um, la <laughs> Dr. Lonnie Howard the other night made a really nice comment, or a very interesting comment at the NAACP uh, dinner, and he said that what troubles him most is that he sees young people, young black people uh, around the city during the day, and obviously they aren't plugged into jobs, and it seems like looking at them, that's, that seems okay with them. He said, that's not okay. And that's, his, what, that's what's taking us out. I think that it's a wonderful thing that we are, ta we are talking. There's great people in this city. I was not born and raised here. I can still love you all. I really can. I was born in Colorado, raised in Colorado. That doesn't make me strange, you know? I, well, you, you may, it might. It might. Um, we're, we're working hard to make everything uh, work in this city for all people. I think that the biggest challenge is catching those people that appear to be forgotten and throwing them a lifeline, which in my opinion is education. Amen. Robin? Good morning. First of all, I would like to thank your pastor for stepping forward and also Pastor Adolph. I am Councilwoman. I'm Councilwoman Robin Mouton and I am Council for Ward 4. And we are diligently working with everyone up here. We want to make sure that our Chief of Police and the Beaumont Police Department has everything that they need. I know a lot of times you see Council strictly on Tuesdays at 1.30 at council meeting, but it's far deeper and far greater than what you see. There are times that we are called into uh, executive sessions and we meet with the chief of police because whenever he needs something, it comes directly from the mayor and the council. So we have to assist our city chief and police department with everything that they need to equip them to go out to be the police officers that we need them to be. Also, I want to commend our uh, Sheriff uh, Stevens and also our district attorney because a lot of times, as I said, we just see them as just people in the community. But 
They wear many, many hats, and they do so many things that we are probably not even aware that they do. And without them and without the work that they do, we would probably be in a worse situation than what we are. I'm also uh, born and raised here. We have five generations in my family, and most of my family <laughs> lives here. Virginia is the only one, I believe, <laughs> when we love it dearly. But to be born and raised here, to be educated here, and your whole entire family live here, I love Beaumont, and I want Beaumont to be a success, and I want it to be a safe place. I've never been afraid to go, roam and go around my city, and I've lived here all my life. But it is, it is a different city now, but we're dealing with different people and a whole different generation of people. And unfortunately, there are some kids that don't have the parents that we probably had and we were probably raised with. But for that reason, we are all subject to, to those different um, circumstances. And we have to live with those circumstances. But we're gonna all have to come together as a community, join forces, which we are, and we are all working together to make Beaumont the city that we know it has been and it will be and it can continue to be. I'd like to ask one question to Gary Senegal with Stop the Violence. Gary, I know that you're out on the street. We were there with you yesterday at the corner of Lucas and Magnolia. So you're out there with the people. And I just, let's let this be the last question. I need to shift now and talk to the family members of the uh, victims of gun violence. But what, what are you hearing on the street? What are you hearing the people say? What is, what, what's the frustration that they're communicating to you? Great answer, great answer. First up, uh, greetings, brothers and sisters. Uh, I want to give uh, honor to, to God and the law enforcement up here, the clergy, and all you beautiful people here this morning. Uh, beautiful people here this morning. Y'all should have clapped for that. Beautiful people <laughs> here this morning. <laughs> I, uh, I've been labeled an activist, community leader, or whatnot. I'm a, I'm a man. I'm a husband, a father, a son, a grandson, a friend, a, a person, a human being. Uh, I am from these streets, uh, born and raised. No shot at you, Miss Virginia. Uh, <laughs> born and raised in Beaumont, her, sis. Beaumont Texas. Uh, my grandfather was one of the first African Americans to open up a grocery store out here. His brother was one of the first ones to uh, be a contractor out here. His other brother was uh, superintendent. Well, he was trying to be superintendent, Dr. Ed uh, Edward Senegar. He passed, uh, rest his soul. But uh, what I, I'm here, I started that because it does two things. When you see words, you, you eternalize it and you verbalize it. Uh, speak things into existence. And I believe you, whatever you speak, it shall manifest because of the power that each one of us has individually. Come on. I don't feel afraid of anything and I don't think you guys should feel afraid of anything because if we are here in the house of the Lord and we have power to tread over scorpions and serpents, why be afraid of a Goliath? David was not afraid of Goliath. David used three smooth rocks to destroy a giant that was superb, just, just overwhelmingly outmatched. But that didn't deter him to get the job completed. So we can be deterred by the Goliath in Beaumont City because I believe that Beaumont is a beautiful city. You cannot have a message unless you have a mess. You cannot have a testimony without a <laughs> test. So God chooses his favorite people. Yeah and give the most difficult trials to them because he will get the glory. Yeah. So it's up to us to stand up, use that power and that anointing that we have on the inside of us and go heal the community. Why are we afraid if we're here praising who we're praising? Why are we down? We have people like, we have people like Bob, we have people like Audwin, Jim Singletary, Sister, sister uh, Get Right, Virginia, Robin, my man here, Miss uh, Zena, we are all here in, under one name, and that name is a powerful name. So when I go to the, to the, to the streets, I'm not afraid. I'm not no. afraid because I know who lives within me. Mm. I know who's behind me. I know who's yeah. on the side of me, my ancestors, and God is with me. So 
I'm getting a little excited because this is beautiful. <laughs> this is beautiful. This is what God is. You said something earlier. You said diversity plus unity is synergy. Yeah. That's an intermingling of cooperative people working together. Yeah. When you see a rainbow, it's, you'll, you'll marvel at it because it's different colors in it. Yeah. It's not just one. It's different. It's multicolored. That's what God represents. All of us here individually, collectively, yeah. working on one accord yeah. for his purpose. Amen. So when I go to the streets, I tell them, they tell me, standing on the corner won't work. I say, well, a stop sign won't work either unless you obey it. I say, just like uh, don't text and drive. Uh, the, we have those signs. It's subliminal imagery. It's subliminal messages that put in your, in your, in your psyche. So yeah. when you see it, you do those two things. You might not verbalize it, but you're going to eternalize it and you're going to think it Stop the violence. Yeah. You're telling yourself your spirit, your spirit man, which is more in control than your physical man. Yeah. And you're actually doing that subconsciously. So yeah. I would like for those signs to be all over Beaumont Amen. because that's just one facet of it. Yeah. But it's going to take the police. It's going to take the councilman is going to take you because another thing communication is key and I said don't be afraid because it's up to you to communicate with the this is 2017 we should be diverse as of yeah, now we should. come on we we know what we've been through racism and everything like that let's stop not be, let's stop being afraid to talk about that it's 2017 yeah and I look around it's diverse that's the key. That's what God looks like. Amen. He's diverse. So we are, don't be afraid when you leave here. Keep that spirit. Keep that power. Keep that anointing with you. Because God has given each and every one of you the talents, the gifts, and the power to go and heal your community. Yeah. You ask that question. You say, what are they saying? Proverbs, Proverbs 17, 27 through 29, or 16, but I think it's 17. It says... <laughs> It says, an idle mind is a devil workshop. She said that you drive throughout the city during the day and you see kids not doing anything. That's idle minds. We're at work. So we can't go in and, and talk, but that's why yeah. I have organizations and we're actually doing things and we're going to have a street ministry. You know, we're going to do other, other things to get out there. But they said... After 6 o'clock, Brother Gary, we have nothing to do. Now, does that condone bad behavior? No, it doesn't. But it's root cause analysis. You have to look at the problem. Uh, an idiot can identify a problem, but a sage will figure out Come solutions on. to that problem. Yeah. I have a saying that says if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. So let's be more part of the solution. Yeah. They're asking for jobs. They're asking for trades. They're asking for skill sets. They're saying, we're not ignorant, Brother Gary. We're, I don't want to do what I'm doing, but I, I need money. And I'm not condoning that. I'm not yeah. condoning that at all I, I, because I believe in accountability. Yeah. I believe in accountability. I'm going to check my people. I'm going to check them. And I say my people because I'm from, the, I'm from that hood. I'm from there. I'm from those streets. And God has raised me up and he has rehabilitated me and he showed, showed me a mature mind state. I have a, a beautiful wife. I want to thank my wife because she puts up with me. Lucretia. And because I'm, all, I'm, I'm being pulled in different, different directions, but I have five sons, two in the military, one that's figuring his way. The second one is actually right now as we speak, he's visiting a college right now because uh, they want to offer him scholastic and, uh, 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 scholastic and athletic uh, a scholarship. My other son, he's a senior. So I check them. I make sure, and they're all of their friends. We have to stop. I'm sorry, I'm going to pass the mic. We have to stop saying, that's not my child. If that was mine, I would have done this way. That, they, they are your children. Yeah, they are. They are, you don't have to be a biological parent to be a parent. Yeah. Start being who God called us to be. Yeah. Healers. Yeah. Healers. Heal Beaumont. Amen. Look at this as a challenge and accept this challenge. Offer Good. jobs. Offer okay. jobs. We need jobs. We need trade schools. We need uh, uh, skill sets. That's yeah. what we need. You want to keep a man from stealing your fish? Teach him how to fish. Okay. We need to make fishermen in this world. <laughs> That's what we need to be. Spread this anointing. Leave here today and use your resources. Use your connections. And we will heal Beaumont. And Beaumont will be a beacon for the entire world. Come on. Okay.
That's the answer to all your questions, Pastor. I'm sorry? That's the answer to all your questions. Say that again? He answered he all did. your questions. He did. I'm going to take up an offering. Uh, <laughs> I need to conclude this segment. Bob, go ahead. You got the last word. I've got $1,000 for your next gun buyback program. I want to be the first contributor. Thank you. Amen. I love it. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 17, the apostle said, respect the government. So to those of you on the platform that serve our community, whether it's in city politics or county law enforcement or city law enforcement, the justice system, the ministry, Gary, whatever capacity you serve, let me say to you this, this morning, on the behalf of our citizens, we apologize for demanding more from you than we were willing to give ourselves. We apologize for criticizing you more than we were willing to pray for you. We apologize for blaming you for our problems while refusing to become a part of the solution. And we apologize for seeing you as a leader with responsibility and forgetting you are a person with feelings. At Cathedral, we honor you for your work and we appreciate you for the person that you are and we applaud you. God bless you. I'm like Councilwoman Wright. I'm a homegrown tomato. I was born at the old Baptist hospital. The best babies came out of there, in case y'all were wondering. On the video that we began with from Channel 12 News, Juan Rodriguez said, it was a little too late for Alex. The gun buyback was just a little too late. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9 reads, the Lord is not willing. Uh, that's, that's a powerful statement. The Lord is not willing that any should perish. He's not willing. Whether they're black, white, brown, male, female, poor, rich, guilty, innocent, doesn't matter. He's not willing that any should perish. And as a community, we've got to stop saying, that's not my problem. That's not my kids. We have to stop that. The purpose of this moment now is to connect a personal tragedy to a public storyline. Because what's happening in Beaumont is happening to us and not to just these individual families. The purpose of this moment is to see the story through the eyes of the victims and not the lens of the camera. The purpose of this moment is to feel their pain. The family members of the victims of gun violence that I'm getting ready to introduce to you to feel their pain and know that breaking news for some is a broken heart for others. We have to remember that with every bullet that's fired, with every life that's taken, there's a heart that's broken. Our text was Luke 15, 5, and he said, when he the person that cares, when he finds it, when he finds that one that's lost, he lays it on his shoulders. He doesn't wait for someone else, but he assumes responsibility for that one person. He lays it on his shoulders. And so today, when you experience the pain of these family members, you need to understand that with that experience now comes the responsibility for us to lay that on our shoulders and to say as a community, 
we need to help heal the broken hearts. So would all the family members of the victims of gun violence, would you please come forward? The Medina family, Holloway family, the Till family, the Meyer family, the Gonzalez family, would you please come? And any other families that may be here this morning that I did not speak to, but you heard about this service and you came, would you please come? Come forward. Why don't we begin with Alex? Anna Marie Medina, you saw her on the video. Um, Miles, go with her. Whoever in your family would like to speak, would you uh, introduce yourself, introduce your son, and then try to help us understand the pain and what your family has gone through? Um, my name is Anna Marie Medina. My son, oh, sorry. Um, my son, Alex Strawway, was the um, first person murdered in Beaumont this year. Um, you know, there, you see on movies and things when the police are walking up your driveway to deliver the bad news. It's surreal when it's your driveway, though. You know, you don't even realize it. And, you know, it takes a long time to sink in. And you see your other children's pain and there's nothing you can do for them. And you certainly can't really do anything for your children who have been murdered. Um, but I like to say every day is a new adventure in grief. Um, I used to be somebody who had a high pressure job and could do all these things. And some days, this Sunday I'm here talking to you. And last Sunday I was flat on my back in bed. I mean, it's just, it's unfathomable that people can do the things that they do. You know, in my son's case, um, he knew the person who's been accused, and that person killed him, dragged him into the back seat of his car, drove someplace to get some clean clothes and some gasoline, and then lit everything on fire. And he gave me nothing to look at. I had never saw my son again. And I just don't understand that where in somebody's mind that they go here, I don't know the answers. I wanna to try to be some help. My friend Ann and I and all these people here, I wanna do something to make a difference for Alex's sake and for my other children, but I certainly, I didn't wanna be here. But I will say that the second time I had interaction with the Beaumont Police Department and Detective Llewellyn was at five o'clock the following morning and they had been up all day, the day that my son had died, and the entire next day. And at five o'clock in the morning, they called me to say that they had a suspect in custody so that I wouldn't see it on the news first. And um, I will be forever grateful for their compassion, their understanding. They're letting me ask them, you know, 400 questions. They solve these crimes, but they're human beings and they show that to you. And as a victim, I guess that's what you really need at that point, is somebody to, uh, to show they care. And after a few months, when the fog lifts, then the grief really begins. And uh, we're not done yet. We're, we're going to get through it, though, because uh, that's what Alex would want. And uh, if we can do something to make anything better, well, we're going to be there. We're out with Gary when he's out. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting you. and um, I, I didn't answer Juan Rodriguez because, uh, you know, I wanted to be that person, but because if, if it helps, then that's what we're going to do. So we're going to try to take some of this grief and pain and anxiety and channel it towards something good. Amen. 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 
someone from the Holloway family. Hi, my name is Demetria Holloway. Still. I want to thank you all for being here today for me, for us. On March 18th, 2012, my pregnant daughter was murdered here in the city of Beaumont by a guy who had been out three months on parole and didn't have the right to have a gun. He killed my baby because she was the girlfriend of the guy who he was after. That was my greatest loss ever. <laughs> I had back surgery and couldn't walk for 10 years. I thought that was the struggle that I was going to have. Never walk again, that's a hard battle, but my hardest battle was, was your baby. my baby getting killed. I stand here today as the face and the voice of the broken, the hurt for all these here for her two kids right here, for my parents. It's a pain that I'll never be able to get over with. <laughs> Even though it happened five years ago, <laughs> my heart is forever broken. But I had people like Bob Worth and who was there for me. Thank you. You helped me when we was in court. <laughs> you did. <laughs> Robin, you gave me words of encouragement when I seen you. Amen. And I'm here today to thank you for giving me a voice for her. Gary, for giving me a voice for her because I hurt every day. Amen. I cry every day. And I'm somebody that works crisis. It's been the top and I, I can't hardly do it broken as I am. But God has given me the strength to do it because he said, for a time like this, I'm going to sustain you. So, I need y'all to help my family be there for us, all of us. This is my family. Yeah. When you see us somewhere, give us words of encouragement because I need it. Her kids need it. My daughter need it. We all need it. And I just, it's so much I could say, but I just want to say when her funeral went forth. That was the hardest day of my life. I don't know, I was grandparents and everything, but the Bible compares the love that love God has for us like a mother's love for her child. Yeah. It's one of the greatest loves there is. Amen. And I used to sit in the chair where y'all at and I used to say, oh my God, but now I have these shoes on my feet. I'm going to walk the street with you, Gary. I'm going to walk the street with you, Pastor. Yes. I'm going to be that first, that face and that person. Amen. Thank you. And I thank you. Thank you. God bless you. Someone from the Till family?
Ladies and gentlemen, this is Deshonda right here. I never seen no one that was not exact twin was the spitting image of her mother. This here, put the dimples in all. She just, that smile she had when she had it and gave it to you, it would just light you up. And you could see the goodness in her and everything. I don't know how or when she went, I don't know. But she had the best people that was raising her. She had a Christian, when I say a Christian, not necessarily her mother, but Kizzy, Kizzy Lee Williams and Aaron Williams. They were Christians. Amen. And they knew how to do, how to raise. And they raised that girl. I don't know why or what deferred her or what, I can't tell. But I knew that I had nothing to worry about because I knew who was raising her yeah. and everything and all. But I promise you this, Bob Worthy, you'll never prosecute this one. Bob Worthy, you'll never, pro you'll never prosecute this one. Amen. I'm going to see to it. I guarantee it. I guarantee it. My son, Robert Pride Jr., I told him that if I don't complete the task, he do it. If he don't do it, I told him, get his son to do it. Make sure that this never happened, not to my family, not to mine. I was just looking at the sign that not in my city. I said to myself, I say, they just, it's a good sign. I say, it's hard to believe that things like this can happen yeah. here in Beaumont, Texas. I was raised here also and everything. And you know, I, I know um, Ms. Zena, uh, the sheriff, and uh, I, they told me that was Rose was her mother. And uh, I told uh, my sister Tusi and uh, Plucky and Moni, they were all real good friends. And I say, well, dog, I say, they all family just like we are and everything. And I always say, well, they all raised together and everything and all. But these here, they are my responsibility. They were my responsibility from the start. But I let my brother-in-law and my sister-in-law help raise them. Amen. But I guarantee you, these won't be in the system. Come on, brother. Thank you. Good. Well done. Bless you guys. Andrew Till. Two months ago to the day my wife and unborn daughter were taken from me and my family due to gun violence. And uh, from what we gather so far, there was absolutely no motive, no reason, just, just, just violence, just a violent murder. And uh, dealing with it has just been extremely difficult. The good Lord above has given me strength and my family's behind me and friends and the community coming together has, uh, has given me strength as well. But taking the mother away from our daughter we have now and my wife away from me and taking a chance for us to raise another daughter for absolutely nothing is just, it, there's no words for it. You can't explain it. You can't understand it. You'll never understand it. But with the support of the community, my family behind me, friends, my daughter, we, we're gonna make through we're gonna make it through this. All of us, everybody here. I wanna thank all the city leaders, city council, all of you. You are doing y'all's job, y'all are doing a great job, even though it gets overshadowed by all the bad on the news and everything else. Who's up who <clears throat> excuse me, who it's up to now is us to come together as a community because there's a lot more good in this world than there is bad. Unfortunately, the bad overshadows the good. So we could come together, all of us, the good, and just do what we can to defeat this evil and defeat the bad. And you never know if, if you see Beaumont go from the third most dangerous city to the most safest city in Texas, come it can on. make an impact and change the whole world. You never know what can happen. So, so the good come together and defeat this evil. That's, that's what we need to do. I like it. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Someone from the Meyer family, would you please step up? Our family. Yeah. 
um, June 20th, 2017, I was awakened to someone just banging on my door. Pippi, get up, get up. Your sister wants you. I get there. They have tape taped everywhere, and I'm not in my right mind because I go to bed so early, one something in the morning, and I get a phone call that time of the morning. I'm like, what's going on? Something have to be going on. I get there to my little sister house. My little, they say my little brother didn't been shot. That's what they say. I didn't want to believe it. My family, I outrage going, you know, going crazy because I, you know, you just don't accept stuff like that when you done been, when you done lost a lot of your loved ones in your family. Because like us, me and my siblings, we don't have parents. I lost my oldest sister eight years ago. That was my baby brother. So, you know, we, we, have, we have a whole lot of questions. We want to know why, what did he do? Did he bother somebody? Then you just can't think that because the way that they shot that house up, God is good because everybody, everybody should have been gone. God is good. That's what I tell my little sister because it was in my house. He lived with my little sister. God is still, still good because whoever these people are, I really don't think they was expecting anybody to walk out of their life. It, it's, it's ridiculous, and this crime, it has to stop. It's, it's, it's real bad. It's yes. bad. It's bad to, well, you know, like my little sister and them, they scared. They are traumatized. I mean, they sat there, they was awakened out there, sleep still running for their, running for their lives. And, I, and I'm just trying to be the big sister and be as strong as I can for my family. Pray. That's what I tell them. It's constant praying, constant praying. My little sister, she was going to be here today, but she had to go to work. But y'all just keep praying for us, please. Lift us up in spirit. And I just know that God is good. I, I know he's good all the time. Thank you. All the time. Okay. I'm here on behalf of the Pratt family. These young people have been in my life since they were youngsters. They hung around my house. To them, I was Mexican mama. Although the irony of it is, I'm not Mexican, I'm Indian. <laughs> but whatever they wanted to call me, I was okay with it. Beefy, I mean, what can I say about him? He was my son. Um, he lives behind four young kids. What can you say to those kids when they are crying, when they're upset, they don't understand? All they know that that dad is gone. They don't see the bad in the parents. They see a mom, a dad. And they love them. And Gary, thank you for all you do, City Litters. Thank you for all you have done and will do. And Gary, I will walk with you. I will run with you. Yeah. Wow. I'm here for Kathy Duncan. She was a homeless woman that was found, raped, found and jumped like a piece of trash out of a car. People walked by her and nobody stopped. It wasn't until a mother saw the body lying there in the parking lot and took her baby's blanket and tried to cover her for decency's sake and called the law. We were involved with Stop the Violence for a while. Beefy was my brother. We got our call Wednesday. We're trying our best to get the word out. And I look at all these faces, Andrew and the Holloways, and two of my newest but closest friends, Anna Marie and Megan, and I see my mom. And I'm showing you strength.
all these wonderful people didn't ask <laughs> to be part of this little strange family. And we're black, white, and even Mexican mamas. <laughs> we gotta do better by our babies. We gotta make sure that they're not gonna be in the system. Thank you all for hearing our stories and feeling our pains for just a little while. But when you go home and you enjoy your lunches and you enjoy your Sunday dinners, remember that we go home and we still go on this adventure of grief. Yeah. Every day is different for us. Don't let it happen to you. Take responsibility for your babies. Amen. God bless you all. That's good, Mama. Would you guys come down here in the altar area if you would? Just come stand down here, line up if you would, and face the platform. We're going to pray for you guys. We understand that you guys are hurting this morning. Like for the prayer team that's been assigned to come and, and just if you would would you just begin to minister to them church would you stand with me this morning In Luke chapter 15 verse 4 our text read what man of you having a hundred sheep if he loses one does not leave the ninety nine and go after the one until he finds it. We've lost some people in our community. It's my prayer that we don't lose any, anyone else. We have to take a responsibility as you've heard this morning. We have to get involved in our community. We have to get involved in our neighborhoods. We have to support our politicians, law enforcement, we have to get behind them, civic leaders, pastors, churches. We have to make a decision that we're not going to give up our city and that we're going to fight for our communities, our neighborhoods, and we're not going to lose another one. We're going to go after everyone. Why don't you reach over and take the hand of the one next to you? Father, today we've come together as a church and as a community. I pray that this service touches every heart and every man, every woman, every young person in this room that's watching on the web will make a decision. I'm going to get involved. I'm going to leave the 99 and go look for the one. I'm going to leave my comfort zone and I'm going to get involved in my community. Father, challenge us as a people to roll up our sleeves and go to work. Father, I'm asking you to give us solutions and ideals. Father, show us how to heal our city. Show us how to address these issues. And we as a church take a stand against the spirit of violence. We take a stand against it in Jesus' name. We speak life and peace to our city. We do pray for our leaders, whether it's city or county or federal, state. Father, we pray for them. And we ask you to give them wisdom and strength. And may they feel the love of this church and the support of this community. We pray for our leaders. We ask you to strengthen them, to bless them and watch over them. Protect our law enforcement. Keep our officers and our deputies safe, Father. They're there every day putting themselves in harm's way. Watch over them and protect them. Father, I'm asking you to bring a move of God to our churches that will create a spiritual awakening within our streets. I'm asking you, Father, to smile upon Beaumont, change its reputation from the third most dangerous city in the, in the state of Texas to the most blessed.
Father, I'm asking you, I'm asking you for our city. We pray it in Jesus' name. And everyone said amen. God bless you guys. Thank you for coming today. We appreciate you being here. Have a great afternoon. Thank you so much.